Hello, hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger at dansfish.com. I'm glad you could join us this Wednesday night. We do this live stream every Wednesday. It's 7 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 9 Eastern for those who might be mountain challenged. Thanks for coming on by. Today, we're going to start with our shipping report as per usual. And then we're going to um, do a giveaway for a pretty cool little live bear. And after that, we'll get into your questions and comments. Uh, so let's start with the shipping report. I have it right here. So we are currently last 12 months running 98.85% success rate. That means the fish arrived alive and in good condition to our customers. And I'm thrilled that if we look at our six month um, running rate, we've gone up a hundredth of a percent. And if we look at our three month running rate, we've gone up a lot, like um, boo -boo -boo, about 5%. So we're getting better as time goes on, which is what we want. We want to get to 99%. <laughs> we're like 98.85, we're so close. I think when the weather turns, we'll get there. Um, the, the biggest problem we had this week was a delayed box. It was delayed in Maine. And if that sounds familiar, that's because there was a different box that was delayed in Maine um, a week ago, a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, that was just on the, yeah, that was just uh, last time. A shipment that went out on 318 was also delayed in Maine. Different customers, uh, but... Maine seems to be a bit of a problem. <laughs> so um, that was the main issue. If it wasn't for that one box, it was delayed overnight in Maine, where it's very, very cold, as you can imagine. Um, it would have been an almost, almost perfect week of shipping fish. Another issue we had that really surprised me was... Um, some of the electric blue orange head rams that we brought in, which have been absolutely fantastic. Um, one of the people we sent those to had some problems. The other people that we sent those to, as far as I've seen, um, didn't have that problem. So hopefully that was an isolated case. Um, but that was, that was a bummer because I've been looking for healthy rams forever and those seemed so good. And hopefully they are for most people. But anyway, that's the shipping report. We're onward and upward. We're going in the right direction. Just uh, one delay and a, f a few odd and end surprises. Black Venezuelan quarries, there was some that had issue with those in their shipment as well. Um, everything else was like uh, kind of a random one or two here or there. All in all, though, we're doing well. I, I like to occasionally look at the overall statistics because what I focus on every day is the problems. I see the issues, I see the, uh, the bad reviews, and I see the, uh, there's very few of them, but they do happen. Uh, there's one out today if you wanna look at a nice bad review <laughs> on our website. Um, and, and by the way, I think, I think usually these things are merited. Usually when people leave a bad review, it's because something went wrong. And so that's, that's fine, that's what they should do. Um, but, but I'm the guy that's like, oh, there's problems. It's my job to make sure those get fixed. So I tend to fixate on those. So it's good for me once a week to get in front of you and not only tell you how it's going. So we're transparent and everyone knows how we're doing on all the stuff we claim to be doing, but also to get a sense overall, how is it going? Cause I can just get, you know, buried in the few problems instead of looking at the vast majority, the, the, 97 point whatever percent, the 98 point whatever percent that is going well. I don't know why 97 got in my head. Ooh. <laughs> Let's never get down to 97. So going pretty well. Almost everyone that's getting fish shipped out to them are happy with them or getting good stock. We're people, so occasionally we mess up, but usually that's not the case. Usually Things are going and there's just random stuff that happens that no one could have predicted or no one would have seen that that would have been a problem. So few and far between though. And the, the team, the, the company and I, um, it's awesome working here. I have to say that. I love this. 
I love doing what I do and I love doing it in the way that we're doing it because it makes me and everyone that works here feel good about what we're doing. I really think we're making a difference. We're getting bigger and bigger. And as we grow, um, we become a better forcing function for positive change in the aquarium fish industry, which is what we are trying to do. So anyway, that's the shipping report. It's pretty good. Um, on to the giveaway. So the giveaway for today is a group of red coral teacup platies. You can tell a teacup platy because they have a different body shape. They are not a balloon platy by any means, but they have a deeper body shape, kind of like a teacup. And we've got a very nice strain. Uh, we have a breeder that does an excellent job with these. See that? Kind of just a little bit, little bit deeper body. Whereas a regular platy doesn't have that so much. And the males and females have it, by the way. It's not just the females that have the deep body. That can just be from being gravid. But see the difference? That kind of more gradual thing. Even a really pregnant regular molly looks quite different than a teacup. So um, it's... The giveaway for today is a, a group of nice coral red teacup platies from a very good source, from a batch that has been rock solid with us. Um, haven't had any problems with these fish. So I think they're going to really thrive for you. If you've struggled with live bearers, and it's no surprise if you have, uh, the industry treats them, treats them horribly. But if you've struggled, uh, then give these, you know, hopefully you can win these. Or if you don't win them and you want to try them, uh, give them a try at dancefish.com. You can buy some there. And I honestly think this is the best group of, of this kind of platy we've ever had. If you'd like to win some or be entered to win some, hashtag tea time. But not golf tea, drinking tea. Hashtag T-E-A-T-I-M-E. -E. Capitalization doesn't matter. There are no spaces. And if you enter that hashtag in the chat, then you will automatically be entered to win a group of these cool fish. Um, I also, while everyone is busy doing that, I want to talk about something that I think is kind of exciting. Um, the American Cichlid Association has invited me to speak at their convention this year, and I've happily accepted. So if you go to the ACA page and click on, well, let me just show you how to get there. So this is the ACA. If you go to convention, click on convention. Go down here, you'll see the speakers. And I have to say, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little, I don't know, starstruck, uh, fanboy, whatever, with some of these speakers. So, um, for example, Ad Connings. Ad Connings has written so many books on cichlids and has brought in so many cichlids. And I'm not going to say he established the you know, Rift Lake African cichlid industry, but he was definitely influential. Uh, he really did a lot for it. So I'm going to be up there with, with it's not Ad, it's actually Odd, Odd Connings, um, which is crazy to me. Melanie here is the curator of the Department of Ichthyology at the American uh, Museum of Natural History. So that's a heavy hitter. Um, and Lawrence is awesome. I've, I've spoken with Lawrence before. I've gone and collected fish with Lawrence before. One of the best speakers I've ever heard. You know who else is an awesome speaker? Um, is Alex from Fishery, from the Secret History Living in Your Aquarium. He gave one of the best talks I ever heard at um, the Fishtoberfest in Portland. But Lawrence is, is great. And then you have, so those are like some kind of heavy hitters. And then you've got Jeremy Bosch, uh, a hobbyist who breeds and raises lots of stuff. A lot of killies, a lot of catfish, a lot of cichlids. Um, Sam Borstein, who's another heavy hitter. Sam is a professor, um, an ichthyologist uh, at the Texas State University. And then you've got little old me, who's just uh, what I think of as just a fish hobbyist who happens to own a fish store. So I'm a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say that it's like, it's not like intimidated or anything but like that. It's just like, 
man, I'm speaking with like professionals, not just in the fish industry, but in science, like people that really know their stuff. So that's going to be awesome. And what is it? Cincinnati? Um, over in Cincinnati area, Sharonville, Ohio. Cincinnati, Ohio. So I'm very excited about this. The This convention, um, it's a pretty big one. And they have a ton of fun. <laughs> they have all kinds of stuff. Uh, some is appropriate for all ages. Some is definitely not. They, they get weird there. So, um, but I'm, I'm really excited to be speaking there. So there's a couple other events that I'll be speaking at as well, but I don't have them close at hand, so I can't share them right now. And a lot of other stuff in the works along that vein. Um, up until now, I've, up until recently, I have pretty much said no to every speaking invitation just because the business has been running me ragged, to tell you the truth. I, I didn't feel comfortable leaving the team in the lurch to go have fun speaking at a fish convention, right? And it's not just fun. It helps the business, and it, there's all kinds of good reasons to do that, both for the business and just for the hobby, and in general, there's, there's great reasons to do that, but I, I didn't feel right about it, but we're... We're to the point now where I think I can do that. So I've started saying yes, and there's quite a few speaking engagements uh, coming down the pipe. By the way, it's been a much better week. Uh, the Our employee that has been out of town for three weeks due to a family medical emergency is back this week, so that took a lot of pressure off. We're able to find a really good person um, to hire in addition, so that's been awesome. And... Uh, yeah, we're next week we should be firing on all cylinders again. I should be get be able to get back to just improving and growing the business instead of just helping fulfill orders and you know helping just a stay above water. Um, orders are growing like crazy and it's amazing and we're so grateful to all of our customers. Um, I know there's a lot of folks struggling out there and I feel for every one of them, but it's definitely not the case here. Things are going nuts here and it's awesome so thanks to everybody okay so with that uh, let's talk about just a couple this will be brief i want to I highlight a few fish that we've listed for sale recently mostly because people have been wanting them for a long time so chili raspberries we've got a nice healthy batch um, our last batch was great for people and for us and then suddenly out of nowhere it something happened like we Almost all of them did well, and then we had a few left to sell, and something happened. They just didn't do well. So the new batch we got in a couple weeks ago, um, we had our fish health officer check them out. We now have someone full-time that they, they just examine fish, work up fish under the microscope, um, test for disease and all that. So we found some little buggers in the chili raspberries, which were causing them to have an issue and that's awesome i mean it sucks that they had the issue but that's awesome it means we know how to treat them now so this last batch that we have um they've all been treated they've all they've been examined since treatment and the uh the the parasites they had are no longer there and the eggs of the parasites are no longer detectable either so they're, they're cleaned out and i can tell a real difference the other ones we've had have been great probably top of the line in the industry. But now that we've figured out what's going on with them and have been able to, to treat them for that, they, this batch is just big and fat and sassy, and I'm very excited about it. So this is probably the best group of chili raspberries we've ever had um, because they're the same as before, just now we've found something that we can do to improve them by treating something that was... Um, affecting some of them. The next thing is the blue axle rod eye rasboris. We've, I don't want to say we've figured these out, but this group that we've brought in has been rock solid. And I think the reason is the same. We, uh, the, the day they came in, when they were first unboxed, we were able to examine these and we we're like, oh, there's the issue. We found some little uh, protozoans. And so we were able to pinpoint the issue. We treated them that night. And the result has been that they're 
doing great now. So we finally found, at least in this ship, so I've, I've, I have struggled with these guys. I've brought them in from every supplier that has them available. I think maybe once or twice have I ever been very successful with them. Um, and now I think I know why. So this batch is doing great. If they do well for our customers as well, then we'll know we really have something. And then if we can get future batches, treat them and have the same result, we'll know that we kind of cracked the code. So it's early days. It's been a difficult fish for us, but I think we might have finally figured them out. Um, just in time for summer tubbin, we have some paradise fish available. This is the fish that I would recommend um, for lots of different patio pond type setups. They can take cold temperatures, they can take hot temperatures. If you have a, if you're thinking that you want a betta, but you don't have a heated area for the betta, and you have a decent size, like large bowl or small aquarium that you were going to put your betta in, this might be a better choice. They get a little bit bigger than a betta, but not much, not, not huge. And they breathe air just like a betta. They're, they're like a beta that are betta that, um, that doesn't need to have warm temperatures. And one of the biggest problems with folks keeping bettas is they put them in, you know, containers um, that are smaller than your average aquarium, not set up like your average aquarium. And I think one of the main problems is they just don't keep them warm. It's not like your typical aquarium where you've got all the filters and you've got the heaters and all that. It's like, well, that's just like a two gallon bowl. Why would I, you know, I can't even find a heater that looks good in there. So paradise fish, much better option. Daisy's rice fish are back in stock. Uh, Rainbow shiners back in stock. And we were able to bring in some festivum cichlids that were uh, bred and raised in aquariums. So that is good because we brought in some wild ones and uh, they come in with icky stuff. Like, and I don't mind icky stuff. Most icky stuff we can treat. It's like, hey, we found the icky thing. We know how to treat that. But the festivums were coming in with some, some weird stuff that we found very difficult to pinpoint and treat. Uh, Pandagara back in stock. Blue Diamond Angelfish. Oh, the reason I brought these back, I wasn't going to. But the wish list, so many people were asking for these that I just was like, oh, I'll bring them in then because so many people want them. They're kind of pricey, so I was a little reluctant, but it's a good-looking group. The fins on them look pretty good. Um, they don't have those like weird cross fins that you can get a lot of times. They look well like this, like this one here. And they do have the diamond scaling on them. It's not showing in this picture. Uh, maybe you can kind of see it there. But you can really see it here, the diamond scaling. Pretty strong in these guys. More Harlequin Razaboras, Bolivian Rams, Odessa Barbs, True Siamese Algae Eaters, Sparkling Garamis, another one that we found what the issue is. So we've been able to treat those and get them very healthy. Yeah, it's just a world of difference. When you, when you finally find the thing that is causing them to struggle and you can pinpoint treat that and verify that it's been treated, that's awesome, but you can also see the difference in the fish, and it's pretty quick. Within a couple of weeks of having eradicated the issue, they, you know, they've gained a lot of weight. They're they're acting a lot better. It's 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 been very satisfying to have someone who just full time they're just making the fish healthy. It's it's just so it's a night and day. It's so good. Um, anyway, a couple other things as well. So. I know that the blue axle rod eye rasboras are something a lot of people wanted, and chili rasboras are another one that a lot of people want. So I uh, just thought I would tell you about those. But yeah, we're we're learning so much. Just there's hours every day that are just spent on a microscope looking at fish and figuring stuff out. So it's no longer oh the fish are in ooh that those don't look great what's going on well we have no idea what's going on okay well let's try this medicine oh that didn't work okay let's try this one. Oh, that didn't work okay let's try this one well that seems to have worked a few weeks later well they're still doing okay i get i th i guess they're ready to go 
but now we can actually verify this stuff. It's, it's been amazing. I, it feels so good. It feels so good. <laughs> to actually know what's going on, actually be able to treat it, and be confident it's actually treated. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, enough about that. That's what's going on here. Let's find out what's going on with you all. Um, going to get your questions and comments. Before we do that, though, I want to thank our moderators. Hey, mods. Hello. Thanks for being here. Thanks for donating your time to make this a fun, uh, a fun chat for people to hang out in. Okay, I'm going to scroll up here and see what I can see in the chat, what questions or comments I can answer. Hello, right back at you, Mountain Greenery. Dan Khaki Nurse, how are plans for your July Fish House barbecue coming? Non-existent. It's happening. We're having a barbecue. We'll open up the uh, fish warehouse here in Sheridan, Wyoming um, on the 5th and the 6th of the July 4th weekend. And we'll feed you. We'll have a bunch of fish geeks here, I, I think, uh, for you to hang out with. And a lot of fish for you to see. Like, you can get lost in here for a couple days pretty easy, I think. So, that it's definitely happening. But the last three weeks, it's been all we've been able to do since we've been short-staffed with you know, staff having medical emergencies in their family and, and all that. Um, we've been short two people for three weeks. And uh, that means no planning has happened. We've just been like struggling to make sure everyone gets their fish and that the fish are healthy. And just keeping up with that, it's all I've been able to do. So I'm just about done catch up. This week I, I caught up on most of the like admin stuff that I'd been pushing to the side, you know, while we were short staffed. And uh, starting next week, I hope to be making some, some real progress on future plans. Geek boy, yeah, but none of them have that incredible head of hair in healthy green glow. <laughs> Are you talking about me versus the, uh, the other speakers at the American uh, Cichlid Association convention? Yeah. <laughs> How green is it? I'm just curious. Uh, for you guys on your monitor, I'm using a green, a green screen, obviously, which is why, you know, there's that little green around. But how, how bad is it? I mean, I've tweaked the settings. I think it's okay, but I don't know what you guys are seeing. How green is the glow? Cool videos from a cool guy. I recently got a pair of red cherry shrimp and a pair of really shrimp, and one is orange and one is red, and they're all doing great. Hey, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, when you get like a variety of shrimp colors all together, uh, we call that Skittles, Skittles shrimp. And I think that was coined by LRB. Shout out, Lucas. Khaki nurse, but the people love you, Dan. Oh, I love them back. I, I like people a lot. Yeah. I mean, so I've just got to make sure that the presentation um, is airtight and buttoned up so that I don't look like a complete idiot speaking next to uh, true professionals. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty confident in my ability. I, there's, there's only been one presentation I gave where I really regretted it. Um, and... Uh, it's I. It was a big. I learned something there, um, so. My understanding when I went to talk was there would be a computer I could use there, and there would be. Um, good internet access, and so a lot of what I did, I was talking about killifish, and I was trying to show like their natural habitats and things. So I had a bunch of video, showing the fish's natural habitats and them being collected in the wild and things like that. So that was a big part of the presentation. And uh, when I was giving the presentation, I, I couldn't get online. I couldn't get the video to play. I, it, was just a, it was just really struggling. And so what I learned from that is don't rely on technology. And by the way, I don't think it was the club's fault. Um, there's something about being on someone else's computer and on someone else's internet and all that. Like, I, I don't know what happened. I don't, I'm not throwing the club under the bus. 
it was it was me i you know i this was a learning experience for me and they were wonderful they were great hosts all that stuff so uh this was my failure but um what i learned from that was structure your presentations so you can give them um even if the technology fails so don't rely on the technology that's what that's what I learned. So that's kind of what I do now. I, I have very simple ways to present that even if everything went wrong, it would still work. So I still feel bad about that. I, one of these days, I'm going to contact them and be like, you know that presentation I tried to give for you guys? I, I think I owe you another one. And I'll pay my flight and everything if you want. You know, I, it went bad, and I felt really horrible about it. But that's the only time. There's only been once when, when I felt like I didn't do a good enough job to give everyone their really good experience. In general, I'm pretty confident about it. I mean, I, I used to be a college professor, so I'm used to lecturing. I'm used to talking. Um, I've been on stage more times than most people have had hot breakfasts, um, you know, acting and in, in in the theater so yeah it's something i really enjoy jacob metzner hey dan are zamora woodcats available to you from time to time yes um okay is it this species that rings a bell so i believe so let's let's look at this fish folks i believe that i can get this one in um I tend to avoid woodcats. I like them, but they've never been very good sellers for us. So I like the, the ninja woodcat. Like that one, I think, is good. I like the honeycomb. Uh, is it Perugier? I think. Um, there's a few that I think can do okay, but besides those two, they're very difficult to sell. And those two are very difficult to find from reputable sources where I think that the fish are actually handled correctly and going to do well. So I don't bring a lot of woodcats in, Jacob, for those reasons. But I would like to. And yes, I have seen, I believe, I don't think I'm lying to say I've seen those on the list recently. Uh, the, Z the Zamora, yeah. Super excited for my shipment to arrive tomorrow, says Connor. I'm excited for you to get it. Yeah, I, hope, I hope it's everything you wanted and more. We always try to delight the customer. We always try to make it so when they open the box and look at the fish, they're like excited about it instead of disappointed by it. That's what we try to do. But, and you know, 98 plus percent of the time, we actually do it. Spinster sister, do you have cash app? Donate to the tartar sauce fund for 2024. Need blonde koi guppies from Israel. Um, the tartar sauce fund. <laughs> I don't have a cash app, no. I've never needed it, cash up, but you know, maybe one day we'll do that. I have been trying to find the blonde koi guppies. I have not seen any more available. I believe that's true. Or were we able to get some in recently? No, we were able to get some snake skins in, but I don't think I've been able to find the blondes. Big Steve's glass box creations gifted another dance fish membership. Big Steve, thank you so much. That's like, that's three, four weeks in a row. Thanks, Big Steves. Lumi, whenever I see that, I think Illuminatus. Pseudomuga Illuminatus, because that's my shorthand for Illuminatus. When, I, when I'm trying to write, you know, Pseudomuga Illuminatus, and just on my notepad, talking to myself, uh, I always write Lumi. <laughs> Thank you so much for all you do for our fishy friends. Hey, you're very welcome. It's, it's indeed, it's my pleasure. Like, I am so happy to do it. I, I love what we're doing. And thanks for noticing, and thanks for the generous super chat. Much appreciated. Saltwater koi message retracted. Well, saltwater koi, I don't know what you wrote there, but it looks like YouTube didn't like it. <laughs> but thank you for the super chat nonetheless. Okay, I'm really curious. Oh, it won't let me, it won't even let me see it. Well, I literally can't see what was retracted. Are you misbehaving, saltwater koi? Probably not. I mean, every now and then, algorithms get things wrong. Every now and then, often. 
Okay, scrolling down here. Here we go. Do you have to sacrifice a fish when the... Dan, I can't read the rest of that comment. There's Saltwater Koi. Hey, Dan, do you know when the Black Darter Tetras from a few videos back will be on the website? I think the ones that... We don't have a lot of them. And the ones that we have, I think, are all sold out. We might have one or two left in a tank over on... Where is it, Johnny K. Row? But I don't think so. I, I think they're... I, I'm looking for more Saltwater Koi. I'm looking for more. That's one that a lot of people want and is a little hard for me to source. So whenever I can find them, if the source is reputable, reputable, I do really hard, I do try really hard to bring them in. Okay, I need to take a drink. I'm stumbling over simple words and I need an excuse for that. Cheers. I mean, it's just water, but it's still an excuse. <laughs> oh, chat just jumped. Hang on. Ooh. Let's catch up here. Can you get the pygmy sunfish? Yes. We have a group of pygmy sunfish right now, and we're just putting weight on them. So I have Elisoma Everglady, and we're just feeding them lots of baby brine shrimp and frozen bloodworms, putting some weight on them before we list them for sale. KMK, Kumk. That's what I'm going to say. It's not KMK, it's Kumk. <laughs> Kumk. I've been really interested in half beaks. Oh, what a neat group of fish. Yes. To complement the peas and autos in my tank, my tank, would half beaks bully the peas? The only thing they've bullied are snails. Even small shrimp are fine. No, the half beaks are not going to bully the pea puffers. If we're talking about wrestling half beaks or platinum half beaks. Um, my concern would be though that even though they're not doing it right now, that over time as they grow and all that, that the pea puffers would start bowling the other fish in that tank. So I don't know for sure that's going to happen, but I've seen it happen lots of times. Might not happen in your case, but uh, that's what my concern would be, would be the reverse of that. Killers, reptiles, and aquatics. Bob, hello. How are you, Cod? Father, hope you're doing great. Good to see you. Skipper Scotty's little, real little fish. If you're in California, come to the Coast Aqua Swap. <laughs> little typo there. On April 7th, with the chance to win a gift card from Dan's Fish. Yes. If you are in California, uh, Coast. Let me, let me show you their website for those that don't know. Um, coast. Great Fish Club. Okay, come on, website. There, you can do it. Okay, here's the Coast Fish Club's website. I've linked it there. And they're having an aqua swap, which is you know, tons of people uh, rent tables like a flea market with tons of fish and fish supplies there. So check that out, and that's going to be a great time. I wish I could go to that. The Catfish Den. Hey, Dancefish, will you ever, ever be able to offer your regular plecos at different sizes? For example, Subital L174. I know that would take a lot of time, so they would be costly, but will that happen? That does happen sometimes. Sometimes we bring in... So I don't bring in plecos often and when i do i often bring them in in fairly large numbers and so sometimes we have them for quite a while and they actually gain quite a bit of size but no we aren't planning on bringing them in at different sizes it's just they come in at whatever size they come in and then if they grow they're bigger <laughs> that's kind of how it works um i i only know one pleco breeder that can produce plecos in industry numbers that I trust. Now, I'm not saying there are, there aren't others out there. I'm not trying to badmouth anyone else, but there's one person I found that does a consistently good job. They're sourcing 
is uh, I, I trust their sourcing. They buy their brood stock from people like Ingo Seidel, from um, the L Number Conference in Hamburg, Germany, where, you know, places in, from true Pleco people where you're, you're much more likely to be getting the real deal. There's a lot of mislabeled fish in the Pleco hobby. And there's a good chance that if you spend the money for a really expensive, like 173, that it might not be a 173 or not a pure line 173. So there's been a lot of confusion uh, in the past with hypensistris and such. And so there's been hybridization and other things that have happened. So this guy, though, does a really good job, I feel, getting the, the true brood stock of the, the real pure species. Now, he's a human being. That might not be true in all cases, and I'm not, you know, I'm not studying my mitochondrial DNA and such to to know for sure. But it's someone that sources carefully. It's someone who has access to real experts uh, who can look at their stock and say, yeah, yeah, that is that. For example, there's been a question. Well, yeah, now's a good time. Why not? I'll, I'll do this. L1, L471. This has been an issue, this Pleco. So the L471 Mini Snowball Pleco. I've been buying these from this particular breeder for quite a while. I've sold many, many of them. And a while ago, a catfish hobbyist who knows his stuff and who I trust and respect a lot got a hold of me and was like, Hey, the ones I've got from you have grown. They're, uh, they're over three inches. And I was like, oh, that's a problem. Maybe the ones I got are Contradents instead of L471s. Or maybe they're L201s, the Snowball Pleco, instead of the 471 Mini Snowball Pleco. So I was very concerned about that. And I, um, so I emailed my breeder. And I was like, okay, you know, this guy's fish are growing this big. How big are yours? And he's like, oh, they're three to three and a half inches. It's like, so they're not many snowballs then? He's like, no, no, they are. It's like, but those are only supposed to grow to two and a half inches. He's like, well, just because the internet says something doesn't make it true. And I was like, okay, well, where did you get your stock from? He's like, well, I bought my brew stock from Ingo Seidel. And I was like, well, that's, that's point number one in your favor. For those that don't know, Ingo Seidel is like a true catfish expert. He's written books on the subject, lots of articles on the subject. He's a sought-out speaker and expert in the field. So it's like, well, that's good. So I was like, okay, these, these then must be L471s. And my, uh, my friend who I'm telling you about who bought them from me and they grew too large, who raised this whole concern in the first place, uh, talked to some of his breeder folks friends who said theirs have also got larger so it's like oh okay so this is a case where the internet's wrong this is like the mini ranger pleco where they're only supposed to get two and a half inches but the mini rangers actually get quite large what five inches seven inches something like that these seem to top out at three to three and a half inches but then um but then this this catfish enthusiast friend of mine who by the way if if you're listening my friend Tons of respect and love at you. Um, I'm not saying any of this to, to throw this person under the bus. In fact, nothing I say here I think should be taken that way. But um, anyway, a little while ago, got back to me and said, you know, one of my friends who breeds these has a two or two and a half incher that has eggs trapped. I was like, oh, shoot. So there is a small mini snowball pleco that breeds at that size plus this other one. Well, now I know, don't know what to think. So, um, luckily, um, Hans George Evers is a friend of the breeder that I get my plecos from and was over at his place and took a look at the 471s and was like, yeah, those are real. And they're, they're, Bigger than what the internet says, but the internet's just wrong. Those are those are actually L471s. So now here's 
where we leave this. Ingo Seidel says they're the real thing. Hans George Evers says they're the real thing. I'm buying them from a breeder who's very careful about who he sources from and hasn't steered me wrong in the past with species. But there's still this question of, then why is this other fish, or this, why is this one breeder have a, a male that's, I think, two and a half inches with eggs trapped? I have no idea. That's, that's where the story is at the moment. Um, is it that they can breed at a smaller size? I don't know. Is it that um, that particular group of fish is maybe stunted a little bit, and so it's starting to breed at a smaller size? But with time, it might grow bigger, but maybe not to the full three, three and a half inches. I don't know. I don't know what the story is. Uh, but so that <laughs> that little pleco, oh, still trying to figure it out exactly, but. All I know is Ingo Seidel and Hans George Evers uh, say it's the right thing. And that there's someone else breeding a fish just like that at two and a half inches. That's all I know. And by the way, I don't know if the ones that grow to three, three and a half inches would start breeding at two and a half inches. Maybe, maybe there's no mystery at all. Maybe it's just, yeah, they get three to three and a half inches, but they can start breeding at two and a half inches. I don't know. But now you know as much as I do about the L-471. So anyway, the, the catfish den, I only know one person who breeds them in industry quantities who I really trust with them and, and where I can source them from. There's someone else I would like to work with, uh, and I'm kind of reaching out to see if that can happen. So far, they haven't got back to me, so we'll see if that goes anywhere. And so when I do get them, I tend to get them in large quantities, and sometimes... They have time to grow. Yeah. Oh, but here's where I was going with that. But this breeder doesn't breed. I mean, it's, it's a single person, a single facility. So they don't have like 50 different sizes at a time. They, they breed a group of them and it's like, here's what we have. So it's not like I can even source them in different sizes oftentimes. Sometimes I can, some of them, but not usually. Hey, I'm just happy to be able to get L-174s L, uh, at all. I mean, talk about a rare little fish, the Ocelot Pleco. Like, I'm just thrilled to get them in any size. <laughs> Adam's Electric Universe. Hi, did the fancy aquarium bred swordtail sell well, and are you planning to restock them? Um, was there a specific one you're asking about? Yes, in general, the fancy live bears we have sell very well. And whenever I can, I restock them. But that's a case just like the Pleco case I described. There's one source that I trust to get them from. There's other sources that have them, and I've tried other sources, and uh, they're... Oh, I found this the other day. What was that virus? Is it called megalocystic? Um, I finally found... Hang on. So there is a virus that they come in with from other suppliers, and it's a serious virus. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, megalocyte virus, which is one of those baddies you do not want. Um, megalocyte virus is the virus that a lot of strains of the fancy sword tails have. And so I used to bring in, so here's the saga with live bears, and you can read about this in the newsletter if you go to the, well, let me show you how to do this for those that might be interested. So you go to Dan's Fish. You scroll to the bottom, view previous newsletters. Then here is the, um, the Healthy Live Bearers uh, two-part series, Guide to Healthy Live Bearers. And in there I describe uh, my journey. But in short, what happened was uh, there was a place I could source, and I still could source, uh, the really fancy 
uh, sword tails and such from with the nice big cauliflower fins and the beautiful colors and the good size. A line that's obviously been worked really carefully. The bad news is they are carriers of that virus. And that virus can't be treated. And once they go through the stress of being imported or shipped, uh, that stress is enough to allow that virus to manifest and the fish tend to die within a few weeks. So for a few years, I didn't bring in any of those expensive, really fancy, beautiful live bears. Because I was like, well, I can't be bringing stuff in with this virus. Like, if, if you put that in your tank, that's going to be a problem. It's, that's one of those that, like, government agencies look out for. Because it's so detrimental to fish populations. I have found one source where I can get them and they're, they're free from that virus. Um, I've had them lab tested and such, and there's been no, uh, no finding of that virus. So the breeder I get them from doesn't produce tons. It's to get libraries of that quality, you have to breed a lot of them and only a few of the ones that you breed make the cut. So if they're breeding a hundred, a batch of a hundred for easy math, they might only be able to keep five or 10 uh, because you have to work those lines so carefully. So there's not a lot of them available. But any time that breeder, that source, has them available, I buy them. And I usually buy them out because I really want them. But they're few and far between. And that's why they're expensive. It's, they're not expensive because it's like, oh, it's so pretty. There's a lot of fish that are pretty and dirt cheap. Look at like a cardinal tetra, neon tetra, or a standard live bear, right? Uh, really, really pretty fish. But it's because they're pretty and they're so scarce. They're very hard to get. Um, all right. Who's here? Scott Williams. Scott Williams joined up. Hey, Scott. It's good to see you. Howdy, neighbor. Just down the freeway. <laughs> Stephen P. 2003 gifted five Dance Fish memberships. Stephen, thank you so much. Much appreciated, my brother. I hope you and yours are doing well. And Kelly Foreman, not to be outdone, has also done the same. Thanks, sister. Really appreciate you. I hope I get to hang out with you again, Kelly. That was a great time at the, uh... oh, geez, Pittsburgh. Uh, what was it called? Keystone Clash. <laughs> My mind farted. <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> what fish will you be cooking at the 4th of July? I don't know for sure, but I, I do cook a nice steelhead. I can cook salmon. Um, yeah, I might be cooking some fish, just to be sacrilegious. Johnny says, so it looks like we're 100 days away from the barbecue. Woo, awesome. That's coming fast. Like, that's just three months, really. Yeah. Gold Nugget Pleco Tetra. I believe my deep red koi angel has lymphocystitis. I maintain clean water and have been food soaking with vitamin C daily. Anything else I can do to help him? Um, well, the good news is, is that, okay, am I remembering right? So there's a few different viruses that, and sometimes I get confused. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that lymphocystitis is the one where it's self-limiting. So that means that just keep the fish like you're doing with clean water in a low-stress environment, and they should be able to recover from it, just like you or I would from like the flu or something, or chicken pox, something like that. And the only other thing is, is it lysine? Is that the supplement? Lysine virus. Is that the product? Um, there's a product, I believe it's lysine, that uh, can help with uh, fish that are combating um, viruses. They give it to cats a lot. 
What's the brand name? I've had it before. Yeah, I think it's just lysine. I'm not a veterinarian, so, it, you know, I'm just, just a hobbyist. But if, if I had a fish struggling from a virus and I was trying to do everything I could to help it, I personally would try that. And I think that's the one. I think I have that right. But dig in a little bit because obviously I'm on shaky ground here remembering the name of the product. Tristan Godal, I hear you talk about reading scientific papers on fish. Where do you find these papers? I can never find detailed info on specific fish. Well, let's do that live real quick. I'll show you. Okay. So let's say you want to find out about... Um, pro -sci First of all, know the scientific name. So the raccoon tetra. Um, what is it? <laughs> Let me find the scientific name. It's Procyon, right? Yeah, Hyphesobrycon Procyon. Okay. So, transition there. Let me... This is just going to take me a little bit to get organized here. But... If you put in the fish's scientific name... That's... So... Brycon Procyon Scientific uh, Papers. In then Google Scientific Papers, what do we find? We find all kinds of stuff. Here's an article describing the collection of the species. Click here, you can download the full text. That's, I've read this article, it's great. It describes where they came from. Uh, it's basically the scientific description of the species and the, the naming of the species. Let's see here. This might be the same one. Yeah, I think this is the same article, just from a different source. So that's one way to do it. Um, let's see. Here, let's try another one. Let's try... Let's go with something really simple, like a um, Romino's Tetra. That one, we might just be able to say Romino's Tetra, scientific papers. Yeah. So here is a scientific article um, describing about their schooling behavior, studying their schooling behavior. Here's another one describing their schooling behavior that you could download here. You can read the abstract here and then see if it's... The abstract is just a, uh, a small, um, concise... Oh, jeez, a summary. There, that's the word, summary. Woo, got it. A summary of the article, what it's about. So you can read that and discover if that's something you want to read about. This is a new Rummy Nose Tetra, so they discovered a new species. So this would be the scientific description of that species. Um, this one is not available. You can click here, though, and request it, and often you'll be able to get a, a copy of it. If you're like, hey, I'm just a fish nerd who wants to know about fish, you know, I'm not going to sell this or anything. I just was wondering if I could read it. So... Tristan, that's an easy way to do it. Um, there's other ways you can do it. You can subscribe to sites that warehouse scientific journals like JSTOR or there's lots of them that like when you're in academia, you would subscribe to those and then you have access to a whole series of periodicals and journals and articles and such. So that might be worth it too if you're really into it. But, man, Google the name of the fish and scientific paper or scientific study or species scientific description or something like that. And, yeah, they'll pop up. BK, late but made it. What's up, fish nerds? Hope everyone's having a great, has had a great day. I've had a great day. It's been an awesome week, man. It's been so nice to have, let's not be short-staffed so much. <laughs> It's such a grind on everybody. Uh, but 
everyone's awesome. Like we pulled through it. Nobody yelled at anybody. Nobody ran out of here with their hair on fire. You know, it's, we pull together and make it happen, but it's a challenge. So now that everyone's back and we got the band all back together and we're not short any instruments, it's pretty fantastic. Javier Teno, is there any library that would make a good tank mate for discus? Yeah, um, maybe. There are several species that like it hot. Stuff from the island of Hispaniola, like Limia perugiae, likes it warm. Limia nigrofasciata likes it warm. So there's several that temperature-wise could hang with them. I've never kept them together, though, so I don't think there would be any kind of, like, aggression issues where those lie bearers would nip the fins of the discus or anything like that. They are very energetic, though. So the one thing I could see that might be annoying for the discus is just these hyper-energetic fish, like limias, swimming around them really rapidly all the time. That, that could be an issue. So that's the one thing I would think about. That and making sure, you know, everyone's healthy and parasite-free before they're introduced. Okay, we're at 7.57. Holy cow! We've been going for almost an hour. There's 423 folks here. Hey, folks, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to post again, if you are in the Cincinnati, Ohio area, I will be there speaking at the link below at the American uh, Cichlid Association Convention in Cincinnati, and I'd love to see you, so come on over. AJ Bala, is it possible to get all males if I order the Odessa barbs? Probably not, because we don't have that kind of sex ratio. Um, let's see here, what do we have? I'm looking at them right now. Well, I can't tell from this distance. The last time I was close and taking a really close look, it looked like we had a more or less even sex ratio. So if we ever got a batch in that was male heavy, then we could. But if we have a batch that's, let's say the sexes are even, Say so we have 10 males, 10 females, and you want to order five, and you're like, make them all males. Well, now I have a lot of females, and people don't generally want to buy just females. They want males for the color. Um, the advantage to getting males and females is the males are going to display a lot for the females. So they will get very pretty and very active because, uh, well, they want to mate with those ladies. Christina, how many chilies can fit in a five-gallon with some cherry shrimp? Chilies in a five gallon. I think you could do eight without any problem. Kind of depends on the shape of the five gallon, depends on your maintenance and stuff, but I think eight easy. If there's just some cherry shrimp and some chilies. That's where I would start personally. I might even go as high as 12 myself. Ooh, chat just jumped. Ooh, oh, it did it. It did it. The last one I can see is Matt M. Are the Aplicylus block guy able to be sexed? I've been asking you on and off about those fish for a few years, and I'm stoked you got them in. Would love to breed them. Um, I can sex them. I don't know what the sex ratio is, though. I checked them a few days ago, and it appeared to me that we were pretty male-heavy. I didn't see a lot of females in there, which is great, because the males have all the color. But if you're trying to breed them, you know, you need some females. So... Matt, would you send us an email, hello at dancefish.com, that's H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com, and let us know how many pairs you want, and we'll take a look and see if we can make that happen for you. We might need to do reverse trios or something like that. Cody Miller, what's the age of your species red and lemon blue eyed plecos? Trying to figure out the age of the ones we bought from you. Ooh, that's a good question. I do not know that off the top of my head. The super reds, I don't know. But the lemon blue eyed, we bought from, okay, let me see if I can find it for you real quick. You know what, would you, would you email us, hello at dancefish.com, so I don't take 10 minutes just, you know, scrolling to try to find it in my emails. The super reds, I don't think I can know, but the lemon blue eyed were purchased from a hobbyist here in the United States. 
And so, I mean, if I remember right, I think they were. And so I, I think we could find the age of those out for you. Or if you're the one that sold those to us, could you answer Cody's question here in the chat? <laughs> Save us some time. JM3 Riz. Do you have any podcasts or plan on doing one? I do a podcast, uh, which is these live streams, which I strip the audio and load them onto a podcast platform. So if you go to Spotify or app or iTunes or whatever, um, is it Apple Podcasts now instead of iTunes? Anyway, if you go to wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find the Dance Fish podcast. However, I haven't updated it in a few months. It's been, it's, it's not a huge high priority for us, but it's, it's the same content as, is here on the live stream, just in audio format. So if you're at work or whatever, you know, drive in, it's easier to listen to without having to have the screen on like YouTube and other platforms often make you do. So one of my big beefs with YouTube, I wish I could turn off the screen while I listened to live streams, for example, same with uh, Twitter slash X. Like I wish I could have that going without having the screen on draining my battery. So I don't know if there's a setting I need to put for that to happen, but yeah. Uh, Balins, hey Dan, any chance of getting checkered head standers in anytime soon? Much appreciated. You know, I'm probably not gonna bring head standers in, I don't wanna say ever again, cause I like that fish, but anytime in the near future. And the reason is, is the last time I brought them in, we had them for months and months and months. Like, coolest fish in the world, but no one buys them. So if I was setting up a tank as a hobbyist, yeah, I'd get some head standers. But as a business, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to bring fish in that I, I know will not sell. Charles Adukita. One day I hope I can breed and sell swordtails, sailfin mollies, and other live bears to you, both wild and fancy. I hope you can too, Charles. Like, what's stopping you? Do it. Yes, I would love to buy those from you. So your Kaylee's reptiles and aquatics throwing down a little, a little Pippi Longstocking sticker. Thanks for putting pep in our step, Bob. Nathan Hovey, do you know if the Chinese algae eater is hard or soft water? I could look it up in my encyclopedia, but I figured I'd just ask. Thanks for being awesome. Hey, thanks, Nathan. I, I avoid Chinese algae eaters, so I don't know anything about them. I, it's just a fish that I never want. We have one in stock right now. It came in as a contaminant with some baddest baddest we brought in of all things. <laughs> like those are similar. So I do have one in the warehouse. First one I've had in years. That's a fish I avoid like the plague. I shouldn't say that. It's not fair to them. They're a really neat fish. They're like, it's amazing how they've adapted and how they live and all that stuff. But they're just mean. They're mean in a tank. If you wanted to keep them, I'd just get a tank of just that species in decent numbers so they spread out their aggression and stuff. But who wants a tank of just Chinese algae eaters? So I don't think they're a great tank to keep in the hobby generally. And they're tough as nails. I think they can go in pretty much any water. Gold Nugget Plego Tetris says, thank you. Hey, thanks for your question. I really appreciate you being active in the chat. Blue Ho, I want to say hobbies all the time, but it's not. It's hops. Blue hops. Is it true in your experience that Nothobronchius killies are more prone to velvet than other fish and must be kept with some salt in the water? No, it's not true in my experience. Uh... I have had velvet on Nothobronchius, but I've also had velvet on Bettas. Now, that's not really fair because Bettas have a reputation for being prone to velvet. But we've had velvet on many, many, many different kinds of fish from many, many different kind of families. Kerosins, uh, Cyprinids, Anabantoids, um, Cichlids, all of them. Lie bears, all of them. So... I don't know if Nothobronchius killies are more prone to it or if just uh, killie keepers. I mean, it can happen to Nothobronchius and therefore maybe killie keepers are paranoid about it. But they're right to be. Velvet is, man, I hate that disease. That's one of the, that's one of the most frustrating ones. It's like 50-50. Once they have it, 
once they have it in sufficient quantities for us to notice it with the naked eye, it's 50-50 if they're going to be treatable or not. Because by that, by that point, it's so advanced. Because it's so hard to see. It's... Who knew an algae could be such a problem? Uh, I learned a while ago from the veterinarian that we had in residence here this last summer that it's it kind of, you could describe velvet as a parasitic algae, which is interesting to think about. Now, I know there's all kinds of different divisions and terms and stuff, but that's how I like to think about it. So, no, I don't think they're more prone than other fish. But they can definitely get it, but so can the other fish. Connor! Oh, oh, you're talking to Johnny. Never mind. Vincent! <laughs> I'm up in Tetris back in stock. Ooh. I think we have some. Let's look. All right, if we go to the website here. A mop. Uh. All right, I've got to check. I'm curious. So give me that, that tank's like right here. I'm just going to go look real quick. Oops, knocked the uh, mic pack out of my pocket a sec. Yes, we have uh, a nice, happy, healthy group of Amapa Tetras right there, which I'm pretty darn sure will be listed tomorrow or the next day. Uh, Johnny it has a list, and he's getting together a whole bunch of fish to uh, make available on the website the next couple days. Let me just make a note so we don't forget. List... Um, uh, Tetris. I think they're doing great. I, I don't think there's any reason not to list them. So, Vincent, we should have those up uh, tomorrow. I just need to... I'd list them right now, except for I need to make sure first that someone hasn't already bought them and is just waiting for them to be shipped out. So, like, if they, if they just bought them, like, yesterday the day, or the day before, they might not be shipping till Monday. So they might have been bought... So your Johnny says just a straggler. Hang on. So Johnny, there's a whole bunch in Q3. Tank Q3. If we're talking, if they're talking about the Amapa Tetris, they're probably talking about something else. Uh, can you get any pygmy sunfish? Yes, we have a bunch. We're just getting them fatter. So we have them. And they're doing great. They aren't dying on us or anything, but we want to put more weight on them before we offer them for sale. What we try to do here, and we aren't always 100% successful, but what we try to do here is not just sell healthy fish, but sell healthy fish that are going to absolutely delight the customer. So the customer looks at them as like, oh, that is healthy. I can tell because it's got decent body weight and all that. That's what we really are aiming for. And so... Uh, those pygmy sunfish, they might be ready, like, they're getting real close. That might be something that gets listed tomorrow or the next day, or it might be another week or so. CS, so yes, is there a sign-up deadline for your July open house? Nope, there's no sign-up or anything. You just show up, and we'll feed you. Yeah. I'm going to have a ton of food here, and if more people show up and we don't have enough food, I'll just go buy more. It's loosey-goosey. Now, if you're planning on coming, you know, Shoot us an email, let us know, hello at dancefish.com, just to help us plan. But I, I still don't have the official flyer together, you know, with our address and how to get here and all that stuff. But uh, once I do that, I'll put on there like, you know, feel free to show up, but also let us know you're coming you know, <laughs> that'd be good to know. But if you don't know until like the day before, because your schedule's whack, just come. Don't not come because you didn't let us know. Kelly Foreman, Cincinnati is only a three-hour drive. Jake and I might be able to come see you. Oh, awesome. That would be great to see you guys. Yeah, if that works, that would, that would be a cherry on top of that event. Passing wind. I use YouTube Premium. One of my favorite features is it allows you to min minimize the screen 
and keep doing other things along with also being able to download and listen to it offline. Oh, that is nice, yeah. Glass NYC. I really want to buy some gold rose lines from you. Well, I should have more available. Um, I hope to be getting a bunch in next week, which means they'll be available for sale, provided they go through quarantine without any issues in about two and a half weeks. I have a bunch on order. They are cool fish. I like the variety. Like, I, I like the gold ones with the nice orange or red, you know, rose stripe on them. But I also like the white ones. I like the ones that get the uh, kind of brown modeling coming in. That mottled pattern all over them. Um, I just think they're cool fish. Amy Chan donated. Hey, Amy Chan, thank you so much for the super chat. Are you going to get any sunfish? Um, I've uh, the pygmy sunfish, yes. And uh, we don't really get like megalotus or like the long-eared sunfish or the orange spot sunfish or any of those. Those get a little large for what we want. Every I have access to Megalotus, the long ear sunfish, and it's one of my favorite fish. Because Okay, so look at this fish, people. Check this thing out. Uh, is it Lepomus? Megalotus? Yeah. I remember their name. These things are as pretty as discus. Like, look at that. This fish is stunning. Absolutely stunning. And it's in our backyard. These are native american fishes and this is my favorite one i just think it is absolutely breathtaking um and and i can get them the issue is they get fairly large i mean they're not massive massive i have grunters i don't think they get bigger than grunters but they they get decent sized and I don't know that we appreciate our native fish, so I don't know if there's any market for them at all. So I haven't brought them in to date. I might. When I was a hobbyist, I kept different kinds of sunfish. I thought they were fantastic. But uh, I think people's attitude might be like, yeah, it's just a bluegill. You know, <laughs> why would I buy that? <laughs> okay. Ch chat jumped. Oh, Johnny says they were talking about a pleco. Okay, Connor and Johnny were talking about a pleco whose tail was sticking out, not an Amapa Tetra. Okay. Chat jumps, so I am now scrolling frantically, not frantically, just frenetically, to try to uh, find where we was. Where was we? Here we was, Caitlin DeRosier. A few of my fish had some small white stuff by their mouths, treated with salt. It's helping, but how long should I wait before diluting it and it being safe to add other fish? Ah. So, Caitlin, it totally depends on the cause. Sometimes fish can just rub their mouths and they just get a boo-boo, like if you fell and, you know, scraped your elbow. And it just needs a little time. It's not necessarily like... A big major concern it just needs to heal up sometimes it is a big major concern sometimes they injure themselves and uh, different kinds of fungus or or protozoans or bacteria can like be like you know infect the the wound so it, it just depends on what caused it and how severe it is but to be better safe than sorry I would say you say it's helping. In that case, I would just carry on and be patient. I'd keep the water clean, keep them as low stress as possible, and uh, salt's definitely helpful. And if you want to change the water, you can still do that. Just uh, siphon out the water, and the water you're going to add to the tank, just add the same concentration of salt to that, 
as is in the aquarium, and you can just do a nice water change there if you want to keep the salt. But I, I think I would wait until I saw them acting totally normal, and it was healing up really nicely, and they were pretty much back to normal. The last thing you want to do for a fish that's trying to recover is, is stress it out, because then it's going to have the same issues you and I have when we're stressed. Our immune system gets compromised. Same with the fish. Khaki nurse. This might be a shop secret for you. We don't have shop secrets. We're pretty transparent. There's like two things I don't divulge. Everything else, it's out there. But I was wondering, do you selectively list fish you need to move out? Or do you have just whatever is available at the time listed? No, we, what we try to do is list all the fish that we can because fish don't sell if they're not available for the customer to buy. So one of our biggest challenges right now is just trying to keep an accurate list of the fish that are available out in front of the customers. Because, uh, you know, there's no barcodes you can put on individual fish to really track them. And it's just, it's just harder to keep track of your inventory when you're dealing with live fish than it is when you're dealing with hardware or gum, you know? It's just difficult. But we really want to have every fish that we have available for sale listed for sale so we can sell it so we can make money so we can stay in business and keep doing this. So, yeah. So if we have it and it's available for sale, we try to have it up. Okay, let's go ahead and do this giveaway. Here we go. And this is for some um, red coral teacup flatties. Trying to find a good image of them. There we go. These guys, nice dark red color, deep bodies, little white tips on the fins, really pretty little fish. And the winner of them out of 291 eligible entries is Lisa the Wolf. Not to be confused with Wolf, the Wolf. <laughs> Lisa, congrats, you have won. Let me set my timer here for two minutes. There we go. You have two minutes to chime in and let us know you're here. You do that by just leaving a comment in the chat. Leave a comment in the chat and you will have won. Any fish will do. Gifted a Dance Fish membership. Look at Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for all the memberships that are being gifted. I very much appreciate that. That is quite helpful to the channel. Okay. What's the longest you've had a fish in quarantine before it's, before it's healthy enough to sell? Something like six months, eight months, something like that. We have fish that we've never sold, that we still have, because they've never got to the point where we're comfortable selling them. It's not great for business, but <laughs> you know, we just don't ever want to sell a fish before it's ready. So we sometimes hold on to them for a very long time. Lumi, take your time listing Hestatus. Yeah, we're they're almost ready. The Corridors Hestatus are almost ready. We're just trying to get them uh, all recovered from import, make sure they're parasite free and that they're fat and sassy, and then we'll list them. Like, it makes, if you're just trying to make money, we're, we're being silly. Like, buying fish at low packing densities, so the freight costs two to four times as much as the industry average, and then sitting on them for at least two weeks, if not months sitting on them until until they're fat and sassy and healthy and ready to sell meaning we take all the loss um is a kind of weird business model the traditional business model is get it in and sell it before it dies <laughs> that's it's like i don't like every step in the supply chain is get it and move it to the next phase in the supply chain so it doesn't die on me it dies further down the supply chain so i can make my money like, so the way we're doing it and just, you know, putting a, a halt on the supply chain and being like, no, we'll, we'll take the loss. Um, we'll quarantine them and treat them and, you know, however long it takes. Uh, it's, it's kind of a silly thing, but it's working. 
uh, we're seeing the growth, we're seeing the result, and it is it is working. So I think it's going to be worth it. I think it's going to work. It is working. All right, Lisa the Wolf is here. All right, congratulations, Lisa. Now all you have to do is email us at hello at dancefish.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com. We need your first name. We need your last name. We need your mailing address. And we will get a uh, <coughs> a shipping date it worked out. Get, get that all arranged for you. Lumi says, if I manage to get the Coryhistatus and they end up breeding, how many would one need to have for you to be interested? Um, about 50 or so. I mean, I'd like to buy 500 from you, but 50 would probably be worth it. The, the issue is the shipping. If you were local, it wouldn't matter. I, I, you know, could buy less. But, um, well, that's not quite true. We don't want to take up an entire tank and quarantine just a small group of fish if we can ever avoid it but so there's two things at play here for our volumes one is we're going to take an entire aquarium for these fish for at least two weeks often longer to get them through quarantine and make sure they're healthy before we sell them so we need to make sure that the amount of real estate we take up doing that that there's enough dollar value of fish in that amount of real estate that we can do that and still be profitable when we sell the fish because the space costs money the the time to care for the fish during quarantine costs money the medications cost money uh if we have to send them off to the laboratory for examination or to a veterinarian or whatever that all costs money so there's a certain threshold of dollar value we need in the tank or it just doesn't make any business sense to do it so that's that's one issue and the other issue is the shipping so if if shipping is 60 bucks and you're sending us 12 fish that eh, doesn't really make a lot of sense what's that five bucks for fish just shipping so you have to figure out how to do enough volume to make the shipping make sense as well so yeah, there's a, just some hard economic laws that we have to consider when we purchase fish. But Lumi, you can breed them. Um, Johnny, his, the Johnny at Dance Fish, Johnny that works here, took a few home and he's breeding them. And they, they seem to be spawning pretty easily. So I think they're going to, I mean, they're just going. They're community breeding. Just babies are popping up in his community tank. So that's pretty cool. Creedmoor Aquatics, you're doing it the right way. Believe it, people are getting tired of sick and unhealthy fish and ready for a change. Oh, yeah, and I'm one of those people, and that's why I do it this way. Uh, I'm just... It's just not... It's not readily obvious when you first look at... If, if you're trying to, from scratch, make a business plan, the rules of retail are... The rules of business, basically, are... The quicker you can sell it, the better. You want the cash flow. The, ca the spice must flow, <laughs> right? <laughs> the cash must flow. The cash flow is what keeps your business operable. Because without it, you run out of cash, and now you can't pay your expenses, your fixed expenses. There's certain things that you have to pay whether you have money coming in or not. And then there's variable expenses that as you bring inventory in, those expenses go up and down with the amount of inventory you have but your fixed costs are there period so you have to be flowing enough cash to always take care of your fixed costs for sure and your variable costs you know have to be covered too but those are variable depending on your your volumes so uh so when you look at that then conventional wisdom says Get the product in. We're going to call fish products here, commodities here, just because that's how people think of them in this industry a lot. Get them in and get them out as fast as you can. That's the most profitable way to do it. Your cash flow is best. Your spoilage, which is an awful economic term, business term for, you know, fish dying. 
um, comes from agriculture. When you have, like, let's say you're selling apples and you have a bad apple in the cart and, uh, or in the barrel and you sell half of them and then the bottom half is all rotten because they got in contact with that rotten apple. You know, that, that would be 50% spoilage. Just a <laughs> horrible term when you're talking about live beans like, like fish. So I don't use it, but that's the kind of conventional thinking. It's like, move it on so your cash flow is high and your spoilage is low. That's, that's the conventional wisdom. The problem is, that means that all that is passed on to you, to the hobbyist, to the end consumer, to little Johnny or Susie who's in the fish store and says, oh, mommy, I want that one. Ah, pardon me, I have a stuffy nose. And that's why so often over the years when people have found out that I keep fish, they say this, they say, oh, I used to keep fish, but they all died. That's the story I've heard for decades. And the reason I started dancefish.com is because I wanted to change that story. I want to change that narrative. I don't want to hear people tell me over and over, oh, I, I used to keep fish, but they all died. I want to hear people say, oh yeah, I love my aquarium. It's like, it relaxes me when I'm stressed out. I can just sit in front of it, watch those fish move for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and it calms me down and my stress goes down. And oh, that's the story I want to hear. And to make that story happen, we just have to weigh the ind- we have to change the way this industry operates. So that's why we did it. And that's, but you know what? I, I know I say this a lot, but there's probably people here that haven't heard this whole spiel. How long, uh, why would, you know, it's, you choose how you feel in life. Okay, that's a broad statement. There's some people that have like, you know, issues they're dealing with. But for the large part, you choose how you feel in life because you choose how you set up your life. You can run a business where you have a great relationship with your customers and where you and your employees feel motivated because you feel like you're doing something worthwhile and positive. That is motivating. That makes you happy to go to work. And since we spend so much time in our jobs, why not do it in such a way that makes you happy? Like that is a hack for stacking the odds in your favor that you'll feel good in life, right? So, or you can say, no, that's not what's important. What's important is uh, maximizing profit or whatever. And maybe that motivates you and maybe that makes you happy, but it doesn't make me happy. So, yeah. Cora works good. Think you are in a publicly traded IPO. <laughs> no. There's a fish store? No. No, we're a niche little thing. That, that never happens. We're not. Businesses like this don't scale in such a way that it's ever going to be IPO time. That's not. That doesn't happen not in something like this for something to IPO it has to be kind of endlessly scalable like software or massive manufacturer or whatever yeah okay we've got one more minute okay I'm going to scroll down and see what the bottom comment is we'll get to that one Jeff Pelham's Aquatics I love all my aquariums yeah that's the story we want okay um let's see here Fish Hunter says, can you please shout out my aquarium club, San Antonio Area Aquarium Club? We just had our very first meeting last weekend. Yeah, awesome. Congrats. Let's see if we can find it on the internets. Might be a new enough club that they don't have a website yet. Oh, (laughs) I said San Antonio Area Club, maybe Fish Club would help. San Antonio Fish Keepers, is that you? San Antonio Fish Keepers is the only one I see on Facebook. Is this you? Um, Fish Hunter, if this is you, consider that your shout out. If not, I apologize for the confusion. But uh, yeah, I think fish clubs are amazing. So I like to support them in any way I can. Okay, with that, let's close this down. First, I want to thank my moderators for being here. 
and uh, making sure that the chat runs smoothly. Thank you for volunteering your time. Next, I want to appreciate everyone who is a member of this YouTube channel. Thanks for being part of the Fishmonger crew. Really appreciate it. Uh, Scott Williams, thanks for joining up today. Let's see here. What else? People that threw money at us, thanks for the super chats. People that bought memberships for other people, thank you for doing that. That's amazing. Everyone that was active in the chat, thanks for making this a lively place to hang out. If you were lurking, that's okay too. Hail the Lurker Nation. If you're watching the replay, thanks for watching. And if you're listening to the podcast, that means I finally got the audio stripped off these videos and got it put onto the podcast distributor. So see you on Spotify or whatever. There's already several uh, episodes out there for those that were asking about the podcast earlier, but uh, we're way behind in getting the latest episodes posted. Anyway, I hope you have a great week. Until next time, bye-bye. Wrong hand, bye-bye. See, this hand's like off screen because I'm kind of usually over on this, this side. So I have to remember to do the left hand, which feels awkward. Anyway, bye, folks.